Okay, so I want to start with just uh, some uh, comments about the drive category. Um, first is the stratification theory. In the stratification theory, um, every point uh, in a stratified space has a neighborhood or a, a um, neighborhood basis um, of the so X is in a stratum of dimension D, let's say. Then it has a neighborhood which is um, uh, homeomorphic to RD across the cone over uh, another stratified space called the lake. So a, a typical picture is something like this. Here's a, a piece of a, of a stratified space and um, uh, and this, this is the stratum right here. And so each point has a, a neighborhood which is um, uh, homeomorphic to a, a ball or a, a, an open ball uh, crossed with the cone over the length. So the length here you obtain by um, intersecting with a normal slice and then the boundary of a ball. So the cone over that link is this Y and then the space is locally applied. So th this means that um, the homology and cohomology of this space stabilizes. And if you have a sheaf which is constructible, it means that the um, or can be constructible. So cohomologically constructible. The stock cohomology of S is equal to the cohomology uh, of a neighborhood of it, of one of these small neighborhoods. It, this, this cohomology um, stabilizes. Cohomologically constructible means that the cohomology sheaves are locally constant on each stratum. Okay. Um, so all I'm saying is you don't have to take limits. Usually this is defined to be a limit. You don't need that limit. Um, so some comments about the derived category. Um, the objects are complex as their sheaves and um, the morphism between two complex as sheaves is called a quasi-isomorphism if it induces isomorphisms on cohomology and the drive category is set up so that quasi-isomorphisms become isomorphisms. In other words, enough, enough morphisms are added to, to invert those. A drive functor is that uh, if F, for example, maps X to Y, then there's a notion of F lower star of a sheaf. And in the drive category, we define R as lower star of A to be F lower star of I dot, where A dot I dot is an injective resolution. This means it's a quasi isomorphism and I dot is injective. Typically, you don't have to use injectives. Uh, each each functor uh, has its own collection of sheaves, which are which are acceptable. So for um, the RF lower star functor, I could be a complex of flabby or fine sheaves. In general, it has to be what's called phi cyclic. So in the old theory, we used to say that. We can compute the cohomology of Y and cohomology of X from data on Y. Uh, H, there's a spectral sequence, HA of Y with coefficients and HB of the fiber converges to HA plus B of X. Uh, this is the sheaf RB, F lower star, B dot. And the new or the derived category point of view 
is that H uh, R of X A is H R of Y with R F lower star and beta. In other words, um, in the old days, you, you took the cohomology of the fiber and made it into a sheaf. Today, you add more data to that and it becomes a complex of sheaves in the element of the drive category and pushing forward doesn't change the cohomology. Um, also, there's the notion of triples. Triangles. If you have a map from one complex of shapes to another, then there's a, a third element called the cone, which is uh, AI plus B I minus one, A I plus one plus B I, and so on. Um, this guy is uniquely determined up to quasi isomorphism uh, defined by, by the mapping. And any two sides of a triangle determine the third. And these induce long exact sequences. Um, cohomology and um, Homology of X. Homology of X. So, so it's great. Any any map between sheaves gives a long exact sequence. There's something else to put there. It's not not at all obvious. Any any map between complex of sheaves uh, gives a gives a long exact sequence. So the two standard ones are um, for the exact sequences are pair. Um, if uh, Z is paused and X and U is X minus Z is open. Let's call this uh, I and this J. Then there's a triangle R J over shrink J upper star A goes to A goes to R I lower star I upper star A. Oh, so this is the, the on cohomology. This says the cohomology of x minus b e goes to the cohomology I uh, upper star of sorry, X module Z. Plus the cohomology of X, A, plus the cohomology of Z, A. And there's a dual long exact sequence too, which uh, I'll talk a, a bit about after duality. So a few words about duality. So cohomology H R of X is H lower R of X. If you say it was rational coefficient, yes. Can I ask you a question? How do you think of that triangle up here? Yeah, because I how do I think of this? For me, every time I have to think, I know the J 
It's either J on the left or I on the right or the other way around. And I need to and, think about it every time, like which way around. Uh, so I am intuition. Write it down and look it up in my notes. Oh. <laughs> I can never remember it. But um okay. So we start with A. I restricts it to Z. So that's that's going to be the sheaf A on Z. And I lower star doesn't change the cohomology. So that's going to be the cohomology of Z. And we start with A, that's the cohomology of X. And so now we know there's a long exact sequence with X modulo Z. <laughs> um, so this is this is um J upper star of A is the is the this is the tricky one. With respect to A to this open set U, but J lower shriek is push forward with proper supports or with compact supports. So it's not the cohomology of U, it's the cohomology of U, but this cycles aren't allowed at the edge. So it's the cohomology of the space with the edge chopped off. So that's X modulo Z. That, that, that's, that's not answer your question. Yeah. That, that's how I think about it. Yeah. And the, the other one, there's another one which is similar, um, but But I can never remember this. As you saw, I had to write, write it down and think about it for a second. <laughs> was that what your question was? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it's it's the sign of my lower shrink, which is which is tricky. But um, we're going to see more of that in a second. So, homology and homology are dual to each other. What is the sheaf theoretic statement of this? Well, if you want to make so, so we know how to make homology into a sheaf, but how do you make homology into a sheaf? So you would you would think um, the homology sheaf as a pre-sheaf, you've got an open set in X, and you've got to assign them. Uh, a chain to that. So there's going to be, like, say, a simplicial chain. Summation M I sigma I. There's a simplicial chain on open set. But she's just supposed to restrict. So then someone else comes along and says, okay, well, what about if this is my smaller open set? How do I get a chain on that set? The, the chain is running off the boundary of that set. So to make homology into a sheaf, we have to allow chains that are not compact, chains that, that run off the boundary. So the chains must be allowed to run off the edge. <laughs> as a mathematical saying. Um, so one way to do that is if this is a say a piecewise linear space, um, you you could um, imagine refining the triangulation, allowing infinitely many triangles near the edge, infinitely many substances near the edge. So we have what are they called um, chains with closed support or infinite chains. So let's use. And close support instead of compact support. And these are called Borel moral chains. And when we have, um, so for a simplicial space uh, or for a simplicial complex, if Z is a closed subcomplex of a simplicial complex X and U. Is x minus z, then h i or l more of u. So these are chains on u, but they're allowed to run off the edge. So this is the same as what you usually call x modulo z. Chains on x, but you allow the boundaries to be in z, in, in z. So this is the way to think about Borel-Moore homology. Borel-Moore homology is 
non-compact chains and you uh, closed but not compact. Um, and in their paper, for all and more, um, so X here is assumed to be compact. Is that in this in that quality there is X is X assumed to be compact in so, that quality? Um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a better if, if X is compact here. Other, otherwise, I have to I have to also also allow chains off the parts where X is not compact. Absolutely, you're right. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Brown Moore also defined in general um, the dual of a complex of sheaves, and then Verge came along and said, "Well." Um, There is a sheaf called a dualizing sheaf. Let's call it D, X. So that the Barl Moore dual of A dot is log home of A dot. Into the dualizing. And in fact, in variegated duality theory, many derived categories have a dualizing object, and that you get the dual by homing into the dualizing object. So, what is this magic dualizing sheaf? It's exact, we can see what it has to be because if you start with a constant sheaf, then its dual has to be. Hum the constant sheaf into the dualizing sheaf, which is the dualizing sheaf. But the dual of the constant sheaf is the homology sheaf. So the Borel Moore homology sheaf is the dualizing sheaf. Borel Moore sheaf of chains. So that's, that's a piece of magic. Which uh, is one of the great mysteries of the universe. Why is it that the dualizing sheaf is the is the homology sheaf? What was the definition of the dualizing sheaf? Sorry, what 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 is the dualizing sheaf? Like so, the dualizing sheaf. Like what's the the dualizing sheaf is a sheaf of chains, and it's the sheaf of borel moore chains. The sheaf of chains with closed support. Maybe the statement of Verdier duality is the mystery so, of the universe. Sorry? Together with the statement of Verdier duality, it becomes the mystery of the universe. Well, I don't understand your question. What is the statement? The, the statement of Verdier duality. Of, of Verdier duality. Oh. The cohomology of the sheaf. And there, yes. <laughs> um, Okay, the state of variability is that then um, actually, it's, so it's Borel Moore's statement of duality that the, co that the cohomology, thank you, cohomology of X with coefficients in the dual of A is isomorphic to, actually, I should say, there's a problem with numbering here. Hmm. Yeah, I forgot to say about the numbering. In chains, the boundary map goes down. In sheaf theory, the boundary map goes up. So you've got to put these in negative dimensions to make sense. So this is the sheaf of chains C minus four, C minus three, C minus two, and so on. You have to put it so that, that way the boundary map uh, agrees with sheaf theory. And then the statement of duality is that H minus I of X with coefficients in the dual of A is equal to H I of X A star. The, the dual vector space. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, and by the way, if you use integer coefficients, then there's a Torah term as well, and and so on. There's there's 
I'm going to tell you everything is just over a field, but you can do all this over a ring, arbitrary ring, and you need to use the duality of the ring as well. So there's not time to discuss that. So, um, but just this one comment that I mean, maybe that it's it, this is the I don't know the only way I could understand this mystery is that you can intersect compact chains, which are ordinary homology, with these non-compact chains, and so that's why they're dual. Right. Yes. Um, sorry. So. Um, Because in ordinary homology, you'd have a compact thing. You could intersect, but that, that would be exactly. not right. yeah. That's sort of so, what you're allowed to do. That's right. So, so homology uh, to make homology is compact support, um, and homology is closed support. So to make it into a sheaf, we have closed support homology. So the start homology. of the um, dual ending sheaf is H, so H of the minus I is H I of X, X minus X. This is called the local local homology. The local homology of the space is the stock homology of the dual ending sheaf. And now if F X to Y, um, then we have um, um, F upper star uh, X sheaves on Y to sheaves on X, but Meridian defines F upper shape to be the dual of F upper star of the dual. So this is a new a new way to pull pull back sheaves and. Then the dual of the triangle that I just wrote down is another triangle. What is SHY and SHX? Sorry. Um, SHY and SHX, what are they? Um, topological spaces, even. Uh, so, so the drive category makes sense for topological spaces, or so it could be anything. It could be simplicial complexes, could be topological spaces, could be algebraic varieties. Uh, the, this makes sense in, in all of those categories, and, and F upper street continues is still defined the same way. The right. um, so again, if Z is closed in X, and this is a Y, and in U it's a complement J, then there's another long Z sequence for I lower star I upper street A. Well, to A equals to RJ lower star A upper star A. And this corresponds to the cohomology of X, X minus C goes to the cohomology of X, goes to the cohomology of X minus C. So, so this guy. Is also sometimes called the cohomology that supports in Z. The, this I upper shrink is not going to ask me how I think about this. I just I just have to remember this. It's but it's also called the cohomology of supports in A. So so this triangle is dual to the previous one. Okay. So now let's move on to intersection homology. Uh oh, that was supposed to be 15 minutes. When, when, does, when am I supposed to stop? Every week we try to go for an hour, but then instead we go for two hours. So no, we've got a little bit. An hour, two hours, are you saying? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, okay, well, that's great. Because um, that means I can stretch it to three and not. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's look at the case of an isolated. So this is the this is the fundamental calculation. X has an isolated singularity. Again, I'm, it could be a topological space, could be a simplicial complex, could be an algebraic variety. Here's, and this, I call this part U, and I call this singular point X. And I want to take, um, let's, let's say, uh, U, I'm trying to do it the same way, um, X goes into X, U, J, I. And I want to look at R, J, lower star of the constant sheaf on U. So, um, so what is that? And uh, by the way, I'll often start with a constant sheaf, but you can start with a local system instead. Uh, but let's take just the constant sheaf. So what is so what does that look like? Well, on U, it's still just a constant sheaf, but at X, R J Lower Star says it's the cohomology of a neighborhood intersected with U. So the stock cohomology here. Is the cohomology of a of a neighborhood of your uh, what am I going to call it V V X minus X. What is Q? So U is uh, oh, U is uh, X minus X. Oh, here's the constant Q. Thank you. And V X is a little neighborhood. Of X. Because these things stabilize, as I, as I said. So, well, VX minus X is a deformation retra, or just a, it's just a, it's just the link, the link of X uh, crossed with an interval. So this is the cohomology of the link of X. So if we were to think about the about about this in terms of supports uh, here, so let's look at cohomology degrees. Let's suppose this is um, eight-dimensional. Real eight dimensional. So, what does the stock cohomology look like? At points in U, the stock cohomology just looks like Q in degree zero. But at X, the stock cohomology looks like H zero of the link, H one of the link. H2 of the link, H3 of the link, uh-oh. Uh, how did that, oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry. H0 of the link. In degree zero, we just have the constants. H0 of the link. H1 of the length, H2 of the length, H3 of the length, H4 of the length, H5 of the length, H6 of the length, H7 of the length, and zero. That's what the stock homology looks like over the singular point. Now for intersection homology, my first one I said, let's just take chains, but we're not, not allow chains to hit this point if they have um, 
high code dimension. So that meant that for intersection cohomology, the cohomology, the stock cohomology here was zero beyond uh, dimension three. So I see is the slash. Is the stock cohomology of the intersection uh, complex. So we, we constructed this with chains, but then when Bob talked with um, Pierre Deline, uh, he said, well, you know, we had particular kinds of chains and conditions on all the strata and so on. And Pierre said, well, in the end, in the end, after all that is said and done, uh, you killed the cohomology of both degree three. And so there's a way to do that sheaf theoretically, which uh, doesn't involve chains at all. It's just, just algebra. So, so, so Pierre's uh, conjecture was that I see dot in this case is tau less than equal to three of our I lower star of Q in this case. Can I ask so, so this truncation task. Sorry. So going back to the chains, you said you you don't allow chains which intersect the singular point at right. Uh, and uh, how do you do that? I quote a mention. Sorry? Yeah. Do you like do you have a picture of like to like what's a picture of a chain? That you don't allow. So you need, yeah. So that was a big problem. What is a chain? <laughs> so we tried differential forms. We could say like maybe differential forms that don't hit this point. You have to say what differential forms in the singular space are. We tried singular chains, but but it's very hard to work with singular chains. So finally, for our first paper, we said let's take the whole space to be some plural complex, to be a piecewise linear space. And then we could say piecewise linear chains, but the chains have to have support that doesn't touch this point. So you just uh, so that that can be enough. And so that's how we did the original definition of piecewise linear chains. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and if there's more strata, we said piecewise linear chains whose intersection with the strata have certain dimensional restrictions, which I'll, I'll get into. This is the simplest case. But but um, we struggled for years on trying to figure out what chains to use because uh, um, and the, the sheaf sheaf theory just you don't care about what the chains are in sheaf theory so that made it much easier. While we're stopped, why co-dimension three? Why sorry, why dimension three? So we had um a different theory with different cutoffs and we call those different choices of cutoffs perversities. Uh, the reason was that the biggest cutoff, or if you, if you cut off all the way down to the bottom, um, then you get cohomology and cohomology has a product. So that's great. And with no cutoff, you got homology all the way up here and there's no product on homology. So the worse, the, the less cutoff that happened, the more perverse the chain was, the more it was refusing to do make intersections. So we had various theories and various cutoffs, but one theory was right in the middle. And that theory, and by the way, if there's different cutoffs, homology and cohomology was dual. One cutoff was dual to a reverse, to a cutoff of the complementary type. And one theory was self-dual. And so this is this is the cutoff, which is a self-dual theory. So I'm calling it intersection cohomology, but we called it middle perversity intersection cohomology. And, and that's why the middle comes up. Does that answer your question? Yes. <clears throat> so what is the foundation? Um For any 
uh, for any sheaf tau less than or equal to three of any sheaf f is equal to in degree i is equal to f i if i is less than three, zero if i is greater than three, and the kernel of b if i equals three. So this is the means the means general truncation. He's been using this operation all his life. And um, it has the property that when you take the cohomology of this um, in degree three, you still have the kernel of D and then you divide by the image and so you get the cohomology in degree three. So, so the, the, the cohomology of this Looks like zero H three of F H I of N is less than three. You you might you might just want to put you know, if you put a zero here, it doesn't give me the right cohomology because uh uh but anyway. Um sorry if you If you put, put a zero here and you put all of F here, you don't get the right cohomology because everything is in the kernel. So you get something that's too big. And so in general, so the general conjecture was that um, there's Paris conjecture was that suppose we have X is eight dimensional and it's got say um, even dimensional strata. Stratify space with even dimensional strata. Then I take X minus The zero dimensional strata. This can turn to X minus X two dimensional strata. Contain an X minus X four dimensional strata. Contain an X minus X six dimensional strata. Contain an X minus X. Contain an X, sorry, because X is eight dimensional. <laughs> Oh, let's call this. Oh dear. Um, so let me switch to the complex algebraic case. So instead of using real dimensions, I'll use complex dimensions. So this is complex one dimensional, complex two dimensional, complex three dimensional. And let's call this. J3, U3. Call this J2, U3. Call this J1, U1. Call this J0, U0. Oh, is the rectifying right the right way of the inclusions? Sorry? Are the inclusions the right order? Like, I don't understand. Uh, because if I only throw out the vertices, that's throw, out the, that, throw out the zero strata. Yeah, that's almost all of X. That's almost all of X. Absolutely. And then if I throw out more stuff, isn't it getting something smaller? No, this is. Oh. Oh, Yeah, and it goes the other way. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes. It goes the other way. Thank you. Uh, let's go back. Mark? So then. Mark. Oh, sorry. Um, Mark. Sorry. Um, when X, I, is it um, throwing out everything that's X, dimension less than X, I is the, X, I is the closure. Yeah, I just said X, I is the closure of the three dimensional, X, three is the closure of the three dimensional strata. Yeah. So, so, the, so X, three, X, I is the union of strata of dimension plus nickel pi. Great. Okay. Um, so it sounds like the arrows should go the way you had it at first. Have I got it wrong again? Because if you're throwing out more every time. Oh, thanks, 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 thanks. thanks. Yeah, you're great. I'm on board. Is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so this part, when I throw away all the strata of dimension I, that's like the non singular part. So I start, I start with Q here on U3 and take R, J to lower star of Q. And then I get something on the complement of the two dimensional strata. And so its stock cohomology is going to be the over over the two dimensional strata. Its stock cohomology is going to be <clears throat> sorry. Let J two. Oh dear, I'm messing this up. Let J2 be the inclusion into all of X. So I don't know how to say it. Uh, so, so, so J2 should be the inclusion into all of X. And RJ2 lower star Q over the Next chart on down has all that homology of the length in it, the way I just calculated. And so then you truncate that uh, up to um, degree three. And then take RJ1 lower star of that and truncate that to degree two. And then R. J lower zero star and try to get that up to degree uh, one. And so that's the lean's construction of intersection homology. So the result is that over the over the small strata. There's lots of stock cohomology. Okay. So here's the picture. Mm. Uh, this is the degree of cohomology. This is the dimension of the stratum downstairs or the co-dimension of the stratum upstairs. Now, in the case of an isolated singularity, which we looked at, if I take Ri, Rj lower star, then it's going to have stock cohomology in all of these degrees up to, up to degree seven. But for intersection homology, we truncated it at this point. Um, now, if I just took, if I did that as a starting point, what I would get here is the cohomology of the link. But that's not 
going to be the intersection cohomology. The intersection cohomology is defined recursively. So you start off at degree zero and degree one, push it in and truncate, push it in and truncate, push it in and truncate, push it in and truncate. So at this point, after pushing in and truncating, we'll get the intersection cohomology of the link as the stock. So the stock here is the intersection cohomology of the link and zero above because it's been truncated. So that, that's what intersection cohomology looks like, uh, cohomology of link. For compact support cohomology, remember that for Euclidean space, the cohomology of a disk is lives in degree zero, and the compact support cohomology lives in top degree. So once you've done this, and then you calculate the compact support cohomology, you find that the compact support cohomology lives in these degrees automatically. So, so this is a support uh, diagram for intersection cohomology. Um, now, for perverse sheaves, uh, so is it they, not like intersection cohomology with compact support? I'm not quite sure what you, I understand. What you um, this is co compact. So this is stock cohomology with compact supports. In other words compact support cohomology of a little neighborhood of a point in each of these strata. Uh, it's, it's all, so these Cs are also, so these guys are the cohomology of J sub X upper star of IC. And the green guys are the cohomology of J sub X up to shrink Y Z. But what that means is this the cohomology with compact supports of this little neighborhood. And this is the cohomology, full cohomology. So for, for perverse shapes, these numbers are relaxed by one. So this is the this is the support diagram for perverse sheaves. And it's more or less the definition of a perverse sheaf. A perverse sheaf on such a space X is a complex of sheaves whose cohomology lives in these degrees and whose compact support cohomology of little neighborhoods lives in these degrees. And in particular, the intersection cohomology sheaf is one, but the constant sheaf is not because it has um, uh, I didn't write it down. The, the constant sheaf has cohomology in degree zero, but it has compact support cohomology that goes all the way down here. I just didn't write it down. And the whole Perlmore homology sheaf has um, stock cohomology that goes that goes all the way up. Okay, so so this is this is the uh, support condition for for perverse sheaf. Now, what was the what did you say about the cohomology? Sorry. So in your can you explain what you just said in your in your simple example? Yeah. In 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 that example. We had uh, an RJ lower star uh, Q. We have the stock cohomology here was H0 of the link, H1 of the link, H2 of the link, H3 of the link, H4 of the link, H5 of the link, H6 of the link, H7 of the link. Now it's, you're asking about the compact support cohomology, right? Yeah, what's so the, the compact and and up here it was just Q. Now for compact support on an eight-dimensional space, the compact support cohomology of a disk lives in degree eight. So the compact support cohomology is up here in degree eight, and here here at the um, 
singular point. It's the complex support cohomology of a punctured neighborhood. So you have to think about that, but that's, um, but the link sits inside there. So the, so it's the cohomology of the link gives that compact support cohomology. So we get in compact support cohomology, H7 of the link, H6 of the link, H5 of the link, down to H0 of the link and zero at the bottom. There's no, there's no compact support cohomology of co-dimension zero uh, in in this in this neighborhood because it's um, uh, the only co-dimension zero the only co-dimension zero cycles are the whole thing and it's not compact <laughs> so I don't know how, how else to say it so so this is what the compact support cohomology would look like. Is, is that answer your question? So it would it would come all the way down. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, what happens to to uh, sub varieties? If I have a sub variety of dimension two, this is the support diagram for its intersection cohomology. That's exactly this diagram in dimension two. If I include this into the space, then um, then it fails to satisfy the support condition for intersection cohomology. First of all, first of all, if I if I just try to map. The intersection cohomology of y into x without any shifts, then I get compact support uh, numbers that violate the, uh, this diagram. So, but with a shift, there's a chance, but it still doesn't work because there's three x's here and I, there's only two x's here. So, if I map a two dimensional space, two dimensional stratum, say, into an eight dimensional space, the intersection cohomology doesn't push forward, but it only fails by one if we add this shift. So with this shift, if I map the intersection cohomology of a two dimensional stratum into the space, then it's still perverse. So, so the fact that it fails by one uh, means that the uh, result is perverse. So after a shift. So if y is contained in x, i, then r, i, lower star, i, c, y with a shift is perverse. On X satisfies the perversity restrictions. So, <clears throat> Benson, Bernstein, Galen did a very gutsy thing. They said, "What's with all these shifts? Let's just change the numbering. Uh, let's call this zero. One, two, three, four. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus." Two. It just change the numbering. And, and with that change of numbering, this is zero, one, two, and this one, this one. The change of numbering, when you push forward um, a sheaf, uh, uh, the intersection cohomology sheaf, or even any perverse sheaf, you again get a perverse sheaf. This is a, it, it seems like a, 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 a silly thing to do, but, um, It has wonderful consequences. For example, the affine Grassmannian is an infinite dimensional space. It's an infinite increasing union of finite dimensional spaces. What is the perverse sheaf on the affine Grassmannian? Well, 
It's a sequence of perverse shaves on each of the finite pieces. But in the old theory, you have to keep shifting those. So a perverse sheaf on the affine grass volume is some infinitely shifted, infinite collection of sheaves, uh, and it, it just boggles the mind to think about it. But in the new numbering, you take any one of those sub-varieties, put a perverse sheaf on it, push it forward, it's perverse. So, so this makes the uh, notion of perverse sheaves on an infinite-dimensional space just very simple. Okay, so where did this um, come from? The where did this come from? The you know, there we have our numbering, but maybe if it's just bad by one, this is useful. So uh, that comes from the D module. <laughs> So that comes from the D module vector, uh, which I, I'm, I'm hoping to explain in a few seconds. Um, so the definition is that the perverse shaves as the full subcategory full subcategory of the derived category of shaves uh, satisfying the support conditions. In, in a previous picture, um, which I could write down if you like, but you can read it. It's just numbers. Uh, the pictures, the pictures clear. The, the, there's two ways to say it though. One way is to say that um, the sheaf has to have cohomology only in these degrees and complex support cohomology only in those degrees. Or alternatively, you can say the sheaf has support cohomology in these degrees, and its dual also has support cohomology in these degrees. So, so this is a, just a dual statement. Those support conditions are automatically preserved under push forward. Is that sort of the and then they're, then, the then, they're for, then they're preserved under push forward. That's correct. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, and then the theorem is that P of X is a median category. And it's also Artenian and no theory. So what, what, what that means is that every object is an iterated extension of simple objects. And the simple objects Are the IC shaves of irreducible sub varieties with starting with a local coefficient system, uh, not necessarily the constants, but with local coefficient systems, irreducible local system on the non single one. And then every every perverse sheaf has an iterated extension. I stepped out. X here is the algebraic sub, uh, algebraic variety. So is X algebraic? Are you asking for this theorem, or or just the statement of simple objects? So this is a statement which is purely topological. So this works for any topological space. And in the algebraic analytic case, 
um, this describes the irreducible uh, sub, uh, simple objects. In the topological case, the irreducible objects are still intersection cohomology sheaves, but you have to say what the y's are. It's unfortunate to get it safe. For simplicial complexes, can you say what the y's are? I'm sorry, is why if X is a simplicial complex. So if X is a, if X is a simplicial complex, then the Y's will be so will be um uh yeah so well so the well there's an irreducible notion of irreducible sub complex. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's correct. Um and and now if we start now in the analytic category. If M is complex analytic. Then there's a notion of modules over the ring of differential operators on X. So if D X is a ring of differential or the sheaf of rings of sheaf of differential operators on M and um, the set of polynomial regular singularity D modules. M modules maps under the Durham uh, mapping to the drive category. And the derived category of polynomial regular singularity. Do we have modules? Maps to the drive category of X. And this is the equivalence. This was a cache order. And the map group. And <clears throat> This was proven about the time of the cash and Lustig conjectures. But when the cash and Lustig conjectures were proven, it was clear that the individual DM modules correspond to some abelian, and so these form an abelian subcategory of the drive category of holonomic modules. So these correspond to some abelian and when the cash and Lucy conjectures were proven, it was realized that the intersection cohomology is one of those. So this led to the question, what is the image of this map? And at first it looked hopeless because these things are analytically defined. The regular singularities of some very complex Condition analytically, and you, you, you've got the D module structure and so on. It's, it's the idea that it might even. So, this appeared to, be, appeared to be an analytically defined subcategory. But then Bannison, Bernstein, Deline figured out no, the subcategory you get can be completely described by the support conditions of the sheaves. And it turns out it's exactly reverse sheaves. Mark, what's the word to the left? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> reverse sheaves on it. What's the word bottom left here to the left of DM module? Do what does it say? Yeah. Uh, individual. Uh, individual. Individual. Thank you. It's not a complex. Yes. Uh, just to say a single D module, yeah. 
I couldn't read it either. <laughs> um, so that's where that number came from. It was a surprise. Uh, it was it was discovered, realized that intersection chronology is here, uh, but that in fact you get uh, exactly one more uh, support uh, position. Okay, so there's key structures and specialization. Uh, should I just talk about this next week or should I go on continue? Um, next week is the workshop. Yeah. Oh, there's a workshop. Yeah. Um, okay. Two I'll, weeks. Let me, I'll just, I'll just. Two weeks. In two weeks. Should right. I talk about it in two weeks? Um, how much time do you have left? Uh, I can finish by 11 30, I think. 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Good then... okay. So, the Bans and Bernstein Delaney um, rephrase this in terms of two structures. Um, the two structure is full subcategories on D is D, B, C, X, full subcategories. D less than equal to zero. D greater than zero. And um, by shifting, you can define D less than equal to uh, other numbers, um, such that one um, D less than equal to zero, D greater than one and zero, which is something you have one guy in here, another guy in here. There's no harm between them as zero. And secondly, there are adjoints. Epsilon having D to D less so let's 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 call it sorry. This is adjoint to the inclusion. Epsilon map D less than equal to zero. D D greater than zero. But no, I need this the first one. Well, Tau less than equal to zero. Then for any a dot in the direct category of x, there's tau less than equal you got tau less than equal to zero, a dot mapping to a dot mapping to a third term. And then this this C will so this this tau less equal to zero a dot automatically lives in D less equal to zero, and so um, the third term is what's left over automatically lives in D greater or equal to one. So this C is defined to be tau greater equal to one of a dot, and the, there's always a triangle like this. And then the theorem is that the uh, intersection of these is an abelian subcategory called the heart. So these are axioms. And then the theorem is that the less than equal to zero intersect in the greater group of zero to abelian. It's called the heart of the two structures. So, for example, for sheaves, ordinary sheaves, how less than equal to zero. A dot is A in degree I, is A I, and if I is less than equal to zero, zero, and if I is greater than zero, kernel of D. Number is zero. Tau greater than zero, A dot is zero, is zero if I is less than zero, A I, and I is greater than zero, co kernel. Uh, D F I equals zero. This is the D that goes that moves into the degree zero.
And with this structure, there's a notion of cohomology. Uh, the definition is that the cohomology of A dot with respect to this T structure, maybe I'll put a little T there, is defined to be tau right equal to zero, tau plus H zero of A dot, of A dot. So that's the goal of tau. Yes, we have zero. Now, we have zero. You know. So, for sheaves, what does that do? Kernel D, co kernel D. Who is little D? So, A minus two, A minus one, A zero, A one, A two. So, the, so, so, um, so a, a is a complex of sheaves, and it's got it's got a differential. And so, in degree zero, you take the whole kernel of this one. And so, what happens if we if we truncate at degree zero, we get all of A, but in degree zero, we get the kernel of D. And then we truncate greater. Then we truncate less than equal to zero, that kills everything here and replaces this by the by this the kernel divided by the image. So that's the homology sheaf. So this this equals H zero. But now you can do the same thing with the perverse uh, um, This is if you're. This is if you're taking d less equal to zero. The complexes which are zero and below zero. Yeah. So I, I, I forgot to say that. d less equal zero has a set of a dot such that a not equal zero or i greater than d greater than zero or i less than. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's right. That's what I was asking. So for the perverse theory, P D less than equal to zero is a set of all A dot such that the dimension, I mean, so it, it's just, just the conditions, of, just the sheaves that satisfy that support condition. But instead of having to pick a stratification and so on, there's a way to say this um, without choosing a stratification. Uh, dimension of the set of all x such that h m uh, j x upper star a dot is not equal to zero is thus equal to m and p d greater than zero is the set of all a dot such that dimension of the set of all x in x such that h, sorry, this is a minus m here, h minus m, h m of j x of a tree theta, the down it goes by. It's just a vote. So this is the this is the complex support condition, and this is the closed support condition. But uh, you just have to think about it a bit. It's it's the same same thing as what I what I wrote down earlier. And then so the definition is that if a dot is in d b c of x, the perverse homology of a dot is how Reverse tau, reverse tau, greater than zero of a dot. Reverse cohomology. What's perverse tau? What is the question? 
What is perverse thought, Pita? Uh, what, what is? Perverse tau, the P tau. Next line. Ah, so, um, so having defined this D, there's um, there's there's the adjoint, um, and that adjoint is. Um, essentially, in in any in, the, in any case, it's essentially the, the thing that Deline's construction gives you. It's this iterated sequence of of equations and 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 truncations. But it's a little complicated to say that because you want to start with an arbitrary A and not just a, a local system. So it's a little complicated to say that in general. Um, but but you you get this general existence of a tau uh, just from um, uh, categorical nonsense. Is there a way to think about what this perverse cohomology is like of a sheath like? I guess if you are some you know, words about perverse cohomology. I guess I'm just saying, is there a way to think about it, or like, what? How should we? Cause... Yeah. Well, one thing I can tell you is that if A is perverse, then perverse cohomology of A equals A. <laughs> <laughs> so just like for sheaves, if you start with an honest sheaf. Then it's uh, n degree zero. Then it's cohomology degree zero as, as itself. Um, it, it, I don't have a good way to think about it, and so this, there's a there's an exercise which I keep meaning to sit down and do and figure out what is the perverse cohomology of the constant sheaf. Just just in that simple example, it should be should not be so hard to figure out. Uh, take take our so, what is the rate of the start of constant chain or space of isolated singularity? And also the H upper star of R J L star. So the lesson exercise was I keep meaning to do some time. If I if I don't around the time. Not, if you do zero, it's not just the IC chain. Sorry? When you if you do this just for zero, zero yeah, you yeah. don't just get you well get like so, so uh, the thing is um to do this, you've got to put Q in zero in degree zero according to the new according to the new uh uh um, numbering system. And so if you have just, just a manifold, uh, then then the cost of sheaf is perverse. And so you just get Q. So this means that something's going to happen at the singular point. And I, I expect it's just going to be a truncation, but, but, I, but I haven't but exactly which truncation. I'm not sure. It doesn't make sense what I'm saying. Uh, but it's going to be, it's a sheaf, right? This is a sheaf, a sheaf. Oh, complex of sheaves. Um, so an example is, um, suppose, all these are perverse sheaves. Then, um, Hershey's form a bidding category. So there's a kernel and a co kernel. But there's also a long exact sequence. Because there's a third term. And so there's a, there's a uh, long exact sequence, perverse homology, a degree minus one of B, and that's the H, minus one of C, that's the P. 
H zero of A has to be H zero of B has to be H zero of C maps to P H one of A. Okay, but A and B are perverse. So, so this is zero. H minus one of B perverse cohomology is zero, and this is zero. And H zero of A is A, and H zero of B is B. So I have a short exact sequence. So this must be the kernel or the perverse kernel of C. And this must be the perverse or kernel. So th this is how C gets broken up into, so in, in general, the third term is like a kernel or a co-kernel or a little sum of the two. This breaks C up into a kernel and a co-kernel. And it's exactly the perverse cohomology. So, so I'm not sure that's another way to help, help think about perverse cohomology. It's, it's a, a sort of an edge. And um, is it, sorry, Mark, is it e easy to say what the perverse kernel is? Like if I actually know so the shapes? What I, no, I don't know. I don't know any way to say it. All I know is that we have an abelian category. <laughs> and so every map has a kernel oh, okay. in, that, in that category. But um, there's almost certainly a way to, to describe it. But, so, however, I have to say that um, in the book, um, um, Peso Perver, they have to do this. They have to break C up. And I think it's uh, in the notes that I wrote, I think I gave you, it's the, I think it's the deepest part of that book, how they break C up. There's a whole sequence of diagrams and it's, it's, quite, it's quite subtle. So, so this is this is done in, in general there. Um, I was going to talk about the decomposition theorem, but let me just say a few words about specialization instead. So, in specialization, Milner considered isolated singular points of complex hypersurfaces. So he, he considers the case where F inverse of zero is a hyperservice with an isolated singular point. And he considered um, nearby cycles, F inverse of T, nearby fibers, F inverse of T. And intersected that with a little ball around the singular point. And that intersection is a manifold with boundary, which is called the Milner fiber. And he showed using Morse theory that the homology or cohomology of this vanishes beyond the middle dimension. In fact, in his case, he even proved that um, the Milner fiber has the homotopy type of a wedge of spheres of the middle dimension. So now let's do that um, in general. Suppose we have a variety of X and the map to C, maybe an affine variety. And we look at F in versus zero. And we have a nearby. Um, so so this now now X is a singular algebraic variety. And F inverse of zero is even more singular, but uh, let's look at a single point. 
And we can do the same thing. Pick a little ball around that and intersect it with the nearby fiber. And then Bob and I proved using stratified Morse theory that the cohomology of F inverse RT intersected with this ball vanishes above the middle mid, above the middle degree. Now, in stratification theory, every stratum has a system of tubular neighborhoods. The point stratum has a, a neighborhood which is just a ball. The other strata have, have neighborhoods uh, which are tubular neighborhoods of the strata. And those neighborhoods collapse. And so there's if you put them all together, it takes the work, put them all together, you get a collapsing map stratification theory. Says the union of neighborhoods of strata map to of F inverse zero. Map to F inverses by, by a retraction. And that retraction has the property that what gets mapped to this point is this whole ball. Now, we get, it's a little hard to say what's going on in this intermediate range, but what gets mapped to these points is the fiber of this retraction. And in the middle, it's, it's some combination of the two. So if I take on X sub T, if I have if I have a complex of shapes A dot on X, then I can restrict it to X sub T, and then I can map it by this retraction to X sub zero. And then R R lower star of A dot restricted to X sub T. That's called this is called the nearby uh, cycles. The shape of nearby cycles. You, do you take, um, in other words, you have a sheaf on all of X, you restrict it to this nearby guy. Um, so I haven't drawn this well because you have to choose the nearby guy to live inside the neighborhoods. Right again. Is that when you're restricting A, are you restricting to the whole neighborhood or just to a single fiber? Or maybe it doesn't matter. It's like a single fiber. So here's here's the nearby guy. I, and then I, then I map it forward, push push the sheaf forward, um, and that gives you a sheaf on x zero, and that's the specialization. And this calculation, this Marx theory calculation, says that its stock cohomology is going to vanish beyond the middle dimension, which is the support. So, sorry. This this Morse theory calculation says that says that if a dot is perverse, then the cohomology of F inverse of P with coefficients in A dot vanishes above the middle dimension. And so it satisfies again the conditions of a perverse sheaf. And so this proves using Morse theory that if you specialize a perverse sheaf from the whole space to the special fiber, you're again get a perverse sheaf. I think I, I don't understand the restriction map R. So if XT is a nearby fiber and X0 is a special fiber. 
What is the map R? Uh, what's the last question? What is the map R? So, so map R is defined. So I didn't I didn't define it completely. Um, it, it takes it takes some work to define the map R, but but if you have um if you have a stratified space, then what R does to this neighborhood is it collapses it to a point. Now I need to think of neighborhood twice as large. And what R does out here is it collapses this neighborhood to this point. But inside this region, it's got to map here and squish down. So it's, it's got a combination of projecting and, and squishing down uh, in inside this inside this half region. So it's kind of it's, it's inductively defined. It's, it takes a lot of effort, but but it, morally, what it's doing is it's it's collapsing uh, inside the, each normal slice. It's collapsing a neighborhood of each uh, uh, singular point to, to a point. So. So specialization has a complete geometric construction, and there's therefore also, but it takes reverse sheaves to reverse sheaves. So there's also a demodular construction as well, which people figured out how to do, and was explained to us in the demodular seminar. But it, how they how they ever figured that out, I, I have no idea. <laughs> so okay, okay, so that's all. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Mark? <laughs> What's next time? <laughs> All right. Do you want to keep going in two ways? Would you like um, to? Um, no. So I said everything except the decomposition there. I, I could explain this in more detail, but I don't think that's going to be helpful. The, <laughs> yeah, I'm um, but the decomposition theorem, uh, I can say a few more words about, and also to give some examples of the decomposition theorem, maybe that, because yeah, that's possible. like for torque varieties and square fibers, that's where you really uh, care about it. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, maybe two, but, but it, won't be two, it won't be an hour and a half, just 45 no. minutes maybe. Oh, yeah. I mean, the... so you don't want to impose, though, if you don't. I know you said yeah, no, no, in email. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, great. We're very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs>